Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth in Rhythm Mothership bassist Rusty Allen, best known as bass icon Larry Graham's successor in Sly and the Family Stone. First catching on with Sly Stone protege act Little Sister, Alan would go on to be featured on Sly and the Family Stone's classic mid-1970s albums Fresh, Small Talk, and High and You. Others he has recorded and or performed with through the years include the Edwin Hawkins singers, Lenny Williams, The Temptations, Angela Bofield, George Clinton, Bobby Walmack, and Robin Trower. Having just released a funky new song called Alan has also launched his own YouTube show. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Where are you, Rusty, today? I'm in a town called Stockton, California, which is about 60 miles uh, north of Oakland and uh, about 35 miles south of Sacramento. So I'm kind of like in this farm town with a lot of flat lands and a lot of heat. <laughs> a lot of heat. As a matter of fact, we just went through a week of unbelievable heat. I believe one day was hotter here than it was in Las Vegas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So thank God that's over with. Well, I'm originally from Los Angeles. So, you know, down California a bit, but, uh, you know, definitely familiar with Northern California too. Haven't been to Stockton much, maybe drove through once or twice, you know? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so good to have you, man. I've been a fan going all the way back to the beginnings and uh, really looking forward to talking to you about it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So let's jump way back, see how much you can remember going this far back. You know, I understand you're from Louisiana, but you grew up in Oakland Bay area. Um, how did that kind of shape your, your life and how did you gravitate toward music? Well, um, coming from Louisiana to Oakland, my dad was a naval uh, officer and he worked in the shipyards and stuff at Alameda Naval Air Station. So they were supplying migrating families with housing. 
And uh, so we ended up in Oakland in a little community by the name of Sobrani Park. And that's where I went to elementary school and uh, junior high and everything else. But I don't know, the music thing was kind of like just haphazard. Uh, one, one evening, my dad's brother came over to the house and he always carried his acoustic guitar. His name was MacArthur Bryant. He always carried his acoustic guitar. And so one night we were just messing around. And so we we're in, in my bedroom and he's in there playing these little songs. And he goes, uh, hey, you think you can do that? And I was like, I don't know, let me see. So he handed me the guitar and I started playing exactly what he played. And he went like, oh my God, Leela, which is my mom's name. Leela, come in here, come in here. And I guess that was the beginning of everything right there. Uh, there were other guys in the neighborhood who were older than me, you know, by four, five, six years. And they would uh, sit on their porches with their shiny red guitars and their little Sears and Roebuck amplifiers and try to mimic Chuck Berry. And I just kind of like fell in love with that whole thing, you know, the sound of uh, the guitar and the vibe that it, but the way it made me feel, you know, it was just uh, something that that just happened to me. Like maybe it was already there, I don't know, but whatever it was, it came out at that moment. And that's just what we call history. <laughs> So you seem to have a bit of a natural aptitude for it? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I was just able to like, you know, hear something and uh, kind of like find it on the instrument, you know. Um, I got better as time went along, but um, I never got the real training that I should have got as far as being a, totally functional musician with capabilities of reading and, you know, chording and things like that. And my mom would always try to tell me, you got to take lessons. I'm going to get you some guitar lessons, right? I'm like, okay, mom, okay. But I never would go. Right? <laughs> I'd always end up going to my friend's house and playing and jamming with my friends. So, uh, but yeah, it was just something that I was just able to do for some reason. I don't know. It's kind of strange, really. <laughs> I guess it happens to a lot of guys, though, that same way. Yeah, well, it's kind of a gift, you know, is how I look at it. You know, so many uh, bass players started with guitar, you know, and so how did you sort of um, migrate to the bass? You're right. You're absolutely right, Scott. Uh, I started, Larry did the same thing. I mean, it's like I was playing like a six string guitar. I had no idea that there was a thing called a bass, right? And we play, you know, me and my friends, we play together. And and uh, somebody said, well, you got to play the first four strings, man, because we don't have, you know, we don't have no bass. So I would just play the first four strings on the guitar and just tune it, you know, not tune it down, but just, you know, take all the treble and everything off of it and try to get a bassy sound. And from there, I found out, oh, there's a such thing as a bass, right? And my mom got me one. Uh, it was a St. George. It was a St. George bass. Uh, and she bought me a St. George piggy bag bass amp, which is a really decent Fender copy at the time. I'm talking like, oh shoot, 1962, 63, maybe something like that. I'm, you know, and it's like, okay, I got a bass now, guys. Let's go. <laughs> and so, what kind of, you know, groups were you playing with at that point just friends or yeah just friends we were like uh you know we were teenagers 14 15 and we were playing at little talent shows at, at the high school and you know I had some friends who uh somehow I somehow met um I'm not sure exactly how it happened but uh they lived in West Oakland which was a decent bus ride from Sabrani Park but you know we all had the uh same zeal, you, if you would, for playing music. So they weren't going to come to Sabrani Park. I had to go to West Oakland. So I had to catch the bus with my St. George bass and my piggyback amp and catch the bus downtown Oakland, take all that stuff off the bus, transfer it to an 88 market, put all that stuff back on the bus and go down the street. And then 
you know, uh, take the take the speaker down the down the block, go back and get the kid and until I got to where I was going. It was quite a physical endeavor, but I pulled it off. <laughs> well, how big of a guy are you? Were you uh, strong or wiry or what? Wiry, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, the determination uh, takes precedence over any physical, you know, disabilities or whatever, you know, it's like I was bound to determine to get out there and play some James Brown and stuff with my friends, you know. Yeah. So you're playing a lot of R&B covers and, you know, what kind of stuff? Yeah, we were playing a lot of R&B covers, you know. Um, it, you know, when I was young, my mom used to, like, play a lot of uh, uh, R&B and stuff and, you know, uh, anywhere from Jimmy Reed to Ray Charles to Ma Jamal to uh, Ray Charles live in Newport and all of these great musicians. And, you know, I would be like, just, just stunned, you know, and I'm like in my jammies and I'm like, got my hands on my face and I'm just looking into the speakers and my parents are playing cards and having card parties and everything. And, she would let me stay up instead of making me go to bed. Right? And uh, so, yeah, we were playing, trying to, you know, play stuff, what I say, like by Ray Charles and, you know, some blues things and some Chuck Berry things, some James Brown things, you know. That's that's basically what we started out playing. So what kind of space were you in, you know, and when did you first hear about some of the music that was breaking out of the Bay Area, you know, like Sly and Jefferson? Starship and Airplane and um, uh, Grateful Dead and all those those groups that were breaking out in the Bay Area, Santana. Wow, yeah. Well, you know, um, man, I was into all of that. I mean, I mean, I remember um, I did this gig in, in this club in San Jose. I, I'm about 17 at the time now, and I'm playing with grown men in their 30s and 40s, and uh, we were coming from this gig and I was playing with this guy named Johnny Talbot and he was one of the main guys in the Bay Area. It was Johnny Talbot, it was, you know, Sly was still on the radio, but he was like, you know, forming his band, you know, uh, Jefferson Airplane, all those people were like, you know, playing at the Fillmore. But I distinctly remember driving home and uh, caught the last little bit of on an FM station, the last little bit of, uh, rainy day by Jimi hendrix and man i was like hit with a lightning bolt when i heard that i was like what in the hell and and you know prior to that i had you know got exposed to jimmy uh on the axis bowl is love album and i thought that was just like some other thing from another world right but when i heard rainy day man i was like soul and then that's when i really transformed into the funk rock thing uh my mindset was like more into a rock, rock and roll mentality, um, and a uh, you know uh, a blues rock mentality. I mean, I just love the sound of a a person that could really speak some blues language, man, in high volume with control, right? And Jimmy was the one that really did that for me. So, but yeah, the whole Fillmore West thing. Uh, Sly was playing there. And Johnny Talbot was playing. I played there with Johnny Talbot. We uh, uh, played with Faye Carroll there and we opened for the Jefferson Starship with Jefferson Airplane at the time. And Johnny Talbot had a couple of singles out and uh, Bill Graham, you know, let him come and play, you know. Uh, how did, how did you experience. connect with, with Johnny Talbot? How'd that first happen? I was, I was hanging out with my friends in West Oakland once again. And... Uh, we're like, it's a Sunday and we're just like kind of bopping around. We weren't really playing. We were just like out having a little Sunday drive. And uh, and so I look and I see this guy at the shoe shine stand, which was outside on a corner. And he's sitting up there and he's kind of like got a magazine getting his shoe shine. And I, I look and I say, man, stop the car, dude. Stop it. Hold, pull over. And they're like, looking at me like, why is this pull over? And so they pulled over and I jumped out the car and I ran up to this guy and I said, I want to play bass for you. And it was Johnny Talbert, right? And he, his reaction was like, is this kid crazy or what? And, but he found out that I was very serious and uh, I ended up playing with him. How'd you, know who, how'd you know who he was at that point? 
because we, you know, I've seen his face plenty of times, but we would sit out in front of uh, the clubs while he was inside with his band playing because we were too young to get in. But man, I mean, his stuff was so funky and greasy, man, and just so original. And, you know, we were trying to emulate those guys. Um, and uh, yeah, I ended up cutting my first records with him and I got a lot of experience with him. I got a lot of uh, knowledge and as to how a musician's lifestyle should be and, you know, the types of things that, uh, that a musician should be doing and should not be doing. Uh, some of the things that I should not be doing, I did anyway. You know, how the, how the Bible says that what I should do, I don't do, and whatever, right? But, but yeah, it was with the territory, experience. yeah, yeah. You know, so but it was a great experience with Johnny, and that just opened up a lot of doors. Did you feel uh, comfortable on stage right from the get go, or was it something you had to kind of grow into? Very shy, man. <laughs> I had to grow into that, man. I was like very shy and i was like you know i'll be playing and i look up and people are like say, why are they looking at me what are they looking at me for right even walking into a room i was like i i really didn't like the attention but you know i, I kind of grew into getting used to it and you know i was able to deal with it who, who were some of your early base sort of heroes or guys that you really tried to emulate Jamerson was the first one. I mean, anything that he did with Motown, man, it was like, as a matter of fact, Jamerson influenced me so much that I wrote a letter to Motown and I told them, just like I told Johnny Talbot, I want to play bass for you. And they responded and they sent me a letter back and they said, if you're ever in the Detroit area, stop by. It's Bill USA and we'll talk. I never got out there, but at least I got a response. But yeah, Jamerson was, was a cat. Anyone else? Um, on the jazz, on the jazz uh, side of things, man, Paul Chambers, uh, Richard Davis. Uh, later on, I got into Dave Holland. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the jazz players, you know, the upright players. Um, but as far as R and B, man, Jamerson was the main guy on me, and uh, anyone that was playing with James Brown, I dug too. Hmm. And did you ever get to see Jimmy perform or who were, you know, one or two of the live acts that you saw that kind of blew your mind early on? I got to see Jimmy one time and it's like, once again, I'm like the shy kid and he was at the Oakland Coliseum and I think he might've sold 6,000 seats. So there was like plenty of seats down on the main floor, but my ticket was up on the second tier. And I was like too shy to say, get this man, I'm going down there, right? But that was the only time I saw him, man, he, that he was uh, performing songs off, off of the Axis Bold as Love uh, album. James Brown, I saw a few times. I got to see James Brown up close, man. I mean, and uh, incredible. <laughs> you know, the energy was just incredible. So well, that's like 68 uh, around there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right around up in there. Yeah, well, we, I know that's when Access was out, so that's what I figured we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, how did you then go from, you know, your next gig was with the Edwin Hawkins singers or what happened in between? Or Yeah, I, uh, I ended up leaving Johnny and going to play with the Edwin Hawkins singers. Uh, I wanted to uh, see, you know, what that was like, you know, um, I loved gospel music as well. And I, you know, that was like a, a ultimate situation to be in as far as playing some gospel music. Tremaine Hawkins was still there and, you know, every, you know, it was just amazing, man. And I went in there and did the New World album. And uh, I remember Johnny told me, he said, man, okay, man, don't get caught up, too, caught up in any one genre, right? But uh, I took his advice. And so I did that for a while, but I mean, I traveled with Edwin Hawkins. I got some great experience uh, with gospel music, and uh, yeah, it was it just added to my overall feeling of uh, the way I play bass. It must have been just um, really 
spiritual experience to play with a group that big, you know, with that kind of sound. Yeah. And, you know, and all the bass lines that I came up with, it was like, I just sounded, I just played like, well, this ought to work for this. And this sounds okay doing that. And Edwin never complained or he never said, I don't like that. Or, you know, it was just, everything just clicked. Uh, we went to the record plant down in LA. We cut some tracks there and uh, went on the tour over in Europe and the United States. And it was, it was, yeah, it was a very spiritual, great experience for me. I still hold dear. Was that your first time traveling like that? Like that? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, you know, the little local gigs, you know, was just Sacramento, San Jose, you know, within a hundred mile radius, Reading, stuff like that. But I never, I hadn't gotten on a plane at that point and played anywhere. So that was like exciting, you know. Sure. And so with uh, Talbert or with uh, Hawkins, did you get on any bills with like name acts? Did you get to meet anybody? I didn't get to really meet anybody, but yeah, we did, uh, uh, I remember this one concert at the Keel in St. Louis. Uh, Shirley Caesar was on the bill. She was headlining. Uh, I got to see her and hear her live. And there's there's probably others that I just don't remember right now, but she's the one that stuck out. And uh, she's still doing it as far as I know. Hmm. Amazing. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh you got, uh, you know, a lot of experience under your belt by this point, you know, and what, uh, did you go to Sly from that point or how did you meet Sly or did you meet Larry Graham first or you met Freddie Stone first or what happened? Well, actually, um, I met uh, Larry because Larry would come in, uh, sit in the audience while I was playing with Johnny Talbot. And uh, I guess he thought that I may have had something uh I had enough for him to come check me out, you know, uh, to the point to where we started going. When I say we, I mean me and Willie Wild Sparks, the drummer, who ended up playing with Graham Central Station and his guitar player named David Stalling. Started going down to Larry's house and, you know, messing around cutting tracks. And, you know, he'd give me a bass line and record it. And, uh, yeah, it was Larry, but, the thing that came after Edwin Hawkins that was really something seriously solid was Little Sister. And uh, I had got considered for that through Willie Sparks because Willie was living with Freddie Stone. And while Freddie would be on the road, we'd be at Freddie's house, me and David and Willie, and we'd be practicing. And Willie Sparks was like a, a sline of family stone. I mean, he just loved that band. So a lot of the stuff we were trying to play, we were trying to play off of Sly Records, right? And uh, so uh, one one day, Freddie came home off the road and he heard us playing. We were playing uh, some Little Sister songs. I think it was uh, Stanga and uh, You're the One. Uh, and then Sly did a... a, 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 a a remix of uh, which one was that? I think it was. I think it was "You're the One" or something. Where he took the fretless bass and he started experimenting with fretless bass. Anyway, so Freddie heard us, and next thing you know, uh, we started rehearsing for "Little Sister," and that was uh, that was the portal, the the, the 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 catalyst for the transition to meet Sly, because we ended up opening some shows for Sly. Uh, prior to that, we did a few gigs, you know, uh, around Bakersfield and L.A., some other things, you know. Uh, but we got warmed up and we got pretty tight. And so when it was time to go on the road, it was like, well, who do you open for? You open for your brother Sly. So <laughs> little sister got to, like, open some shows at the Spectrum and some other places with Sly. And it, was, it, was, it was cool, man. It was very cool. Let me ask you this, uh, Rusty. What was your like first impression of a couple of these guys? Let's say Larry. When you first met Larry, what was your impression of him, just as a as a guy and also as a bass player? Larry, um, he seemed like a very 
you know, cool gentleman, man. I mean, he was like, you know, it wasn't like overly boisterous or loud or anything. I mean, he had under control. And uh, when I first met him, it was like, you know, like I said, he had, he he knew about me already because he had been seeing me in the clubs and hearing me in the clubs. So it was like more like maybe with him, it was like, well, okay, I got him over here. Now let's see what he can really do. And so he would uh, play this bass line and he hand me the bass and say, play it right. So I play it and he'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, to the point to where, you know, he gave me a Fender jazz bass. He just gave it to me. He's like, here, man, I want you to have this. And, uh, he had made mention that if he ever left that band, I would be the one that he would want to have replacing. I don't know, man. I was just like, wow, unbelievable stuff, man. Just, I don't know. Divinely, you know, you know, uh, already set in stone, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. Uh, and then, uh, so this was like around 71 or what, like? Yeah, it's around 70, 71, you know, the little sister thing was around 70, you know, like we, 69, 70s uh, when we were like, you know, we were listening. I mean, we were like trying to play anything from Taj Mahal to Mountain to Mississippi Queen, uh, whatever. We were just doing it all. And, uh, you know, that was like the time that all that music was really popping, man. And, and then uh, Woodstock happened and you know, uh, it was it was just it was just all just part of the whole thing that was gonna end up happening with me being in Sly's band. The whole you know just all the chain of events, man. It was like just led to that. You know, it was like it was almost like predestined. It was crazy, man. <laughs> when when so the first time you saw Sly and the Family Stone was when you were actually on the bill, or had you seen them play before that? First time I saw them play was when I was on the bill. I mean, we we were playing at a, a place in San Rafael called Pepperland, and little sister opened for Sly at Pepperland. That was my first gig with them, and uh, wow, it was like it might have been like maybe it was kind of a small place, you know, really small for Sly and the Family Stone at that point. But I guess he wanted to like come into the community and kind of give, you know, back to the people and. So it was kind of, kind of intimate setting, right? Uh, but yeah, man, it was it was it was an incredible show, man. I got to you know sit in the limousine with Freddie and everything, and you know it was like crazy. It was fun. Wow! And you're like how old at that point? About eighteen. 18 yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nineteen years old at the most. Um. So. Do you remember the first time you actually got to interact with Sly? I remember like yesterday. <laughs> I was up at we was up at Freddie's house. Um, I don't know what we were doing. I guess we were like getting ready to practice or something. And all of a sudden, uh, Freddie comes down the hall and says, "Man, Sly is here, right?" And I'm like, "Oh man, Sly is here, right?" So Sly and Bubba, you know, Bubba Banks was his sidekick, right? And they come inside and slides like decked out in these cool duds, man, and just looking just fly and sly and cool, right? So I went to the bathroom. And as I'm coming out of the bathroom, slides coming down the hall to go to the bathroom. And as we pass each other, I don't make eye contact with him. I just walk straight by, right? And he stops and he turns around and looks and he says, Bob. Dude didn't even look at me. <laughs> he didn't even look at me. And I think that that had an impression on him as far as I'm concerned, because everybody else would have been like, oh, mighty sly, mighty sly, right? But Johnny oh. Talbot and them, you know, my coming up with them, it's like, you know, no, nah, I ain't, you know, going to put nobody on no pedestal, you know? I mean, we're all players, you know, you know, you've had great success and you are sly and I respect and love all of that. And I love your music, but, but you know, you're just a man like me, you know? So <laughs> I think that really shocked him. He was like, man, dude, didn't even look at me. <laughs> that was funny to me. Yeah. But that was my first encounter with Sly. That was my first one, so. Yeah, and 
from then, uh, what was your first experience sort of actually having com yet conversation with them, I'm sure, at some point? Yeah. Uh, my first gig that I was going to do with them, actually, it was it was a audition. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But my first uh, conversation with him was over his mother and father's house over on Urbano in San Francisco. And uh, I was there with Freddie and he wanted to speak to me on the phone. So I got on the phone with him and he was just telling me, he was asking me, yeah, can you do this? Can you do that? And yeah, you know, he was like, you know, had this real deep voice and he was saying all this stuff and asking me all these questions and laughing and everything. And I really couldn't understand a word he was saying, but I just said, yeah, to everything. <laughs> and, uh, and next thing I knew we were in Roanoke, uh, Virginia in front of like 20,000 people. And uh, I was surprised to find out that there were two other bass players there. Warren L. Jones, who used to play bass for the Young Senators, Daddy Kendricks, and this other dude, man, um, I can't remember his name. All I can remember is he was white and he was fat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, he played bass, so. So I had us all play, you know, play a song, you know, and I mean, we're at a concert. I mean, people don't pay money for tickets and, they, you know, this thing, this whole audition thing jumping off, right? It's like, wow, this is strange, right? But so I could just pull it off, you know, just by talking to people. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I remember this one time, you know, this, 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 these two couples came in, right? You know, uh, to the dressing room and Sly was like, you know what? You ought to get with him and she ought to get with you. And they switched right then and there, you know. <laughs> and I mean, whatever he said was gospel. But anyway, so you know, uh, Warnell played Warnell, I, and I really liked Warnell Jones. Uh, um, I heard him with the Young Senators. I, I heard that band; they were like, you know, really good. And he played, and then um, then the other guy, uh, the, the the fat dude, played. And then I played, but see, I had already been like nurtured up in Little Sister and, you know, had been doing slide music. So I already kind of had a feel for what that should feel like. And so when I started playing, you know, Cynthia and Jerry, everybody looked around like, yeah, you know. Uh, so I'm like, well, I guess I did okay. But at the end of the night, Sly said, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to put the white dude in the Santa Claus outfit and let him play bass. <laughs> And I was like, man, he can't be serious. And he wasn't. <laughs> but you know, he, he was something else, man. Wow. So you got the gig. What what did you hear about uh, Larry Graham's departure? Well, I remember um at the Cow Palace, uh, which was one of the slide in the Family Stones last gigs before Larry left, we were there and like once again, being affiliated with Sly, Freddie, Little Sister and everything, you know, we had access to backstage, whatever, you know, we could even stand in the wings on the stage while they were playing because we were like family at that point. And Sly came on and I think he performed for maybe 10 minutes at that long. And he said, man, I can't, I, I can't do this. And he left the stage, right? And we were like all wide eyed, like what in the world happened, right? So. So we came off the stage and we we're like backstage. And I remember Larry walked past me and he had a tambourine in his hand and he was just like livid, man. You know, he took that tambourine and threw it like a frisbee, 400 feet. You know, he was like pissed, man. And uh, I'm not sure of the exact circumstances of their departure from each other, but I heard it wasn't that, that good. Well, it doesn't sound good, but I wasn't sure, you know, I've read that he was fired, but then I had thought he also kind of left on his own. So I'm just not sure. I'm, do you know, was it kind of a mutual parting, you think? Or? Yeah, it was probably was more of a mutual thing. He probably got fired and left, you know, on his own, you know, which is probably what he was going to do anyway, you know. So uh, then he, uh, he uh, formed Hot Chocolate, which uh, later became Graham Central Station. Yeah, I love those records, too. Um, so what was the first uh, full show you did with Sly and the Family Stone? Shoot, man. There were so many, Scott, man. I can't remember the first one. Um, 
Well, All I remember is that that audition, man, in Roanoke, Virginia. <laughs> That's, I mean, we had so many gigs. We went everywhere, man. I mean, just everywhere. Uh, I remember going over to England. We were playing at a place called White City or White Stadium City or something like that. Uh, just 100,000 people out there, man. It was like mind-blowing stuff. And somebody, we're on stage playing, and somebody comes out of the wings and whispers in the slides here while we're playing. And uh, then they leave the stage, and then Sly uh, says something uh, on the microphone or something like, Mick Jagger wants to come out here and play with me. You know, it's like, don't be sending nobody to ask me. Come ask me yourself, <laughs> you know? I was like, I mean, anything, man, could happen, man, at any time. You know, just craziness. But there was just so many shows. I can't be, I can't begin to remember the first one, Scott. But um, some of them were not so good. But the ones that were good were good. Oh, yeah. I mean, as good as it got, you know, when they were on. Man, when it was on, wow. Uh, was it challenging? I mean, you said you had already played a lot of it, but was it uh, challenging to pick up any of the catalog tracks that you had to play on those shows? Um, at that time, not so, not too bad, Scott, because like, like you just said, I had been playing that stuff and trying to emulate even the fretless bass things that Sly used to do, man. I used to even try to do that. I got a fretless bass for a while and tried to do that. Um, but uh, a lot of it just kind of like came naturally. Um, what can't about, explain it. Were you able to, were you playing Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself at that point? Yeah, we were doing that. We were doing all of his hits. Yeah, um, well, that one would seem like a challenge to me because it's got such a prominent bass line, but. Yeah, well, the, actually, you know, the the baseline is prominent, but it's more like what do you make it feel like, you know, because anybody can play that song, you know, but it's like, do it have that that last second attack, you know, does it have the right pressure? And, you know, I mean, it's just little things that make it what it is, you know, and, uh, you know, it took it that part of it would might have been a bit challenging because you have to like I had to like just try to dig in so hard you know make make that sound sound like like it was there you know and it was prominent and but as far as any technical technical challenges um it wasn't that bad some of it was challenging but it wasn't that bad did Sly mostly keep to the set lists or did he sometimes mix things up? He pretty much kept to the set list, you know. Uh, if he did something impromptu, it was usually him doing it by himself. You know, Freddie might join in singing or something like that, but he pretty much stayed with the, uh, with the set list. Did you have any awkward situations where, you know, he was late and you just kind of had to fill space? And what was that like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh wow. I mean, I mean, I could talk about that. I don't know if I should. <laughs> uh there was uh this one gig we had in um Bakersfield, California, and uh we had to drive from LA to Bakersfield. And I can't remember um if Larry was on that gig or not, I can't remember, but at any rate, you know, I'm like looking at my watch and I'm like, so hey, man, we gotta get out of here, man. We gotta go play, right? He was like, man, Russ, I don't give a, you know, and we never went. <laughs> I was like, wow, man, it was crazy. <laughs> oh, oh man, my my uh, ex from years ago was at that Chicago show where he didn't show up and they rioted. Wow. See, that was before my time. I'm glad I wasn't at that one. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy times. Yeah. I remember that this one gig, we were in Boston. We were outside somewhere and um, um, we had these like dressing rooms that were kind of like school portables, you know, a couple of them. And man, we were taking too long to come on stage, man. We finally went on stage, man. When we got back to the portables, 
all our clothes and everything were gone. <laughs> Somebody's like, we'll fix you next time. You better be on time. <laughs> I mean, wow. they took everything out of there, man. <laughs> wow. But who were some of the other acts that were on bills that you did with Sly? Um, Ohio players. Um, uh, Fog Hat. James Gang, uh, uh, Mandrill, a few, you know, just to name a few that I can think of. It's like they would they would put a rock band in front of Sly a lot of times, you know, uh, and the bill worked, you know, it worked fine. The Sly was such a crossed over, you know, artist, man, that, you know, his, his audiences were very diverse, you know. Yeah, I'm sure I'm thinking Mandrill probably killed it too, but um, was there another group like Mandrill that you just thought also tore the stage up? Not that I can remember right now, Scott. I'm sure there was, you know. Um, the ones that really stand out to me is the Ohio players because we went to uh, Dayton, Ohio. We went to their hometown. We were like touring Ohio. We did Columbus, Dayton, and uh, I think another town, I can't remember. And they were on the show with us, right? And uh, I remember the first night that we played, uh, we were in the dress room and Sly called everybody around him. And all he said was, you guys know what we got to do, right? And everybody said, yep. And we went out there, man, and <laughs> the rest is history. I remember hanging out with Billy Beck, the keyboardist with Sly, right? And, we, you know, we were in my room. With the Ohio players, you mean? I'm sorry? Billy Beck with the Ohio players, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Keyboard player, yeah. Right. And he was like, man, that's some of the funkiest stuff I've ever heard in my life, man. I mean, he was very, very gracious and very humble. And, you know, he just told the truth, man. I mean, Ohio players, I love them to this day, right, man? We used to go see the Ohio players before they really got big. They had like the Funky Worm with Junie Morrison and they they would play all the Oakland clubs. And I remember even meeting, meeting them. As a matter of fact, they were playing at the showcase in Oakland on Telegraph Avenue. And uh, they were staying in a little CD hotel in Berkeley. So me, David, and Willie, you know, we said, let's go, let's go to their hotel, right? So we drive to the hotel and Sugar, Sugarfoot lets us in, right? And uh, so he's like looking at us and he's like, you know, sizing us up, whatever. And he was like, David, David, David uh, Stallings, you know, he was a guitar player and he had these big, huge hands and Sugarfoot was like, man, you play guitar? He said, how you play guitar with hands that big, right? <laughs> and it was like, funny right so he comes to me and he says can you play and i'm like well i guess i'm all right he's like yeah he could play he could play <laughs> you know so but but yeah sly was sly was like you know when when we had to do what we had to do it was a beautiful thing man yeah take it to the stage yeah yeah sugarfoot i i hear is just a character you know and uh the Ohio Players were actually my first favorite group, you know. Uh, Skin Tie was the first album I ever bought with my own money as a kid. Really? So, yeah, wow. and I remember at the time hearing, I'd read about the Ohio Players and I'd say, oh, you know, heavily Sly Stone influenced and all that. And so it was sort of through the Ohio Players that really helped me get into Sly Stone too, you know, in the beginning um, because they were so heavily influenced by Sly. Yeah, I love, and I love the way they voiced their horns too. I mean, they were very unique as far as their sound and everything. Oh, they, they definitely had a thing, man. Definitely. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that fire album covers back there. It's above those. Uh, yeah, I see. I yeah. see that stuff back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but um, so, how long were you on the road with Sly before you started getting into some studio stuff? Um, I think the not long. I mean, the studio stuff kind of like came simultaneously you would say you know we did some gigs but then you know we'd come back and uh sly was always recording i mean he's spent you know enormous amounts of energy and time you know writing and recording you know uh, 
whether it was in his home studio or whatever, but, you know, I mean, uh, even in New York, you know, um, his apartment, uh, 25 Central Park West, he had like a four track set up in there, Ampeg, you know, and um, then he had the record plant um, in Sausalito. And so we go out and play, you know, and then we come back and start recording. He had a lot of tracks already uh, uh, being developed, you know, so we'd come in and work on them. Would you typically be in there recording with Sly or with Freddie or who would be involved in your sessions usually? Usually it would be everybody. Uh, I'd be in the studio. Uh, Cynthia and Jerry would be baffled in a, in a corner. Freddie be there. Uh, sometimes the drums would, they, would be there, but in other cases, the drums would already be laid. And so we would just play over the drum tracks. And did Greg took off the same time as Larry or after Larry, or how did that go? I think it was right around the same time. Um, our story has it that, that Greg decided to leave. Uh, he made a comment like, Sly has moved to LA and it's over. When Sly moved to LA, that told me that it was over. Now, I'm not sure if he left before Larry or right around the same time, but uh, th those were Greg's feelings, you know. <laughs> when Sly, when he migrated to LA, that was it for Greg. Hmm. All right. So do you remember your first time recording with Sly or is that just something that you just remember in general, but not a specific? Yeah, I remember, I remember very well. Um, uh, in time, that was my first track. And uh, once again, we were like uh, all in the studio together. And uh, I was in the booth, but Cynthia and Jerry were in the, um, in, in the control. And I was in the control room, but Cynthia and Jerry were in the studio and Freddie. And uh, Sly just kind of like sung this little idea of what he wanted the bass to do in my ear. And I said, okay, and just, we just rolled the tape. And uh, I think I stopped one time and punched something in. Uh, other than that, just played it, played it straight down. And that's what you heard. Wow. I love that track, you know. And just overall, Fresh is probably personally my favorite Sly album, just because that's kind of when... I came up and came into it especially, and I came into that style of funk, you know? Right. Um, yeah. You so, know, it's funny too, because the, not to cut you off, but uh, the Riot album uh, was an experimental thing, you know? And, you know, like I said, once again, he employed a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of fretless bass, you know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A lot of fretless bass. And he was playing, him and Freddie were doing all, all the guitars and, uh, very experimental. James Brown would do the same thing. You know, James Brown, um, he had his like R&B kind of like doo-wop stuff. And then later on, man, when Sex Machine and all that came out, that was like a new genre for him, a new direction. So so when Fresh came out, that was exactly what it was. It was a fresh direction for Sly. And, uh, and the tracks, man, like uh, were just amazing, man. Yeah, I mean, it's such a thrilled to talk to a guy who's actually in those sessions because I've just loved that album for so many years and um, there's just so many highlights on that for me um, and time of course is one of them but um, you know some of the other ones that are favorites of mine on there is let me have it all uh, thankful and thoughtful yeah. wow wow you know um, yeah if you listen to Andy Newmark at the end of let me have it all I mean he was Andy Newmark man I'm telling you that dude he knew how to play with a drum machine. He knew how to play with a rhythm king and still make it sound like just straight funky, right? And if you listen to, to the fade out on Let Me Have It All, that's like Andy and, and in the rhythm king and Sly kind of like pecking on the organ, but man, it was just killing, man. And man, I just loved playing with that dude, man. I mean, he just energized me, you know? But yeah, that whole album, man, it's like amazing. A big gripe of uh, let me have it all is it's too darn short, you know? 
<laughs> right, right. Uh, so what was that vibe like in the studio, though? Did you feel like you were really creating something special? Were you a little apprehensive or were you just in, in a, what mindset were you in? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't recall any fear. I don't, I don't recall any apprehension and none of that, man. All I know is we went in there and he whispered some baseline stuff to me and I just played it. And because of uh, uh, God's gift and grace or whatever, man, that stuff came out like it came out, you know, I mean, it's just hard to explain, Scott. And, and, and my mindset was like, man, you know, it it never really set in with me that way that I'm in the studio with Sly. I just ne it never entered my psyche like that. I was just like, I'm a bass player in a studio doing a session. It just happens to be Sly. It could have been Johnny Talbot. It could have been anybody, but it was Sly, right? And a lot of people tell me, man, you don't understand the magnitude of what you did, you know? Yeah. I mean, to this day, it's like, I probably don't hold that with enough esteem. You know, I don't esteem it enough. You know I mean? I'm, I'm grateful and I love it, man. And I'm, I'm grateful, but I just, I never really fully realized the impact that I had being a part of that. And that had being a part of me, you know, it's just like, what, Just when you're a bass player, <laughs> when you're when you're hearing the playback though, or even immersed in recording it, were you thinking at all like, wow, this sounds different? This doesn't really sound like stuff that I've heard. It's like we're onto something here. Yeah, I mean, Sly's music was Sly's music, man. It was like in a class all by itself, right? And so, I mean, we we knew that it was like you know, uh, set you know set apart from the rest, you know. Uh, it's just that just recording it, man, was just like a thrill, man. Just, ah, man, it's just hard to explain, Scott. Just, it's just the feeling that I got uh, hearing the playbacks and everything. It's like, man, uh, this is great. <laughs> you know, this is really cool, man. You know, and, yeah. Well, you mentioned the drum machine aspect, and this was one of the first records to incorporate that um can you tell the people anything about that in terms of you know what your awareness is of how sly got involved with that and what it meant to this recording you know slides just sly he um the rhythm king for some reason was part of his whole uh, writing process and i remember the only other guy that i can really put my finger on as far as using a rhythm king was this organ player i can't remember the name his name, but uh, he had out a song called uh, Why Can't We Live Together or something like oh, that. Timmy Thomas? Timmy Thomas. He used a Rhythm King. And I was like, I wonder who did it first, him or Sly, right? But Sly had a, he wrote around, he, it seems like he wrote around it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it was just so, it was synthesized, but it was organic in its use, you know? Yeah, I mean, even the beginning of In Time, man, it's like Andy solo on with the Rhythm King, you know, um, for the intro. And it's like, without that Rhythm King, I mean, it still would have been funky, but that Rhythm King just put another thing with it, you know, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends and become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.